Welcome to episode 40 of the Croydon Constitutionalist podcast, bringing classical liberalism to South London and beyond via our YouTube channel and wherever you get your podcasts. My name is Dan Heaton and my partner in podcasting today is Mike Swadling, the co-founder of the Croydon Constitutionalist. Mike, how are you doing? Yeah, good, Dan. Uh, I've been away for the first time since February, uh, albeit only overnight, but uh, it was uh, quite a revelation to see something other than the four walls of my house for a change. How about yourself? Uh, similarly, yes. Yeah, I've been into uh, the City of London a couple of times, but also took a, a little trip to Cheltenham uh, last weekend. So that was quite a that was quite a nice change, as you say. It's uh, it's hardly like going to to Spain for a fortnight or anything like that, but it's just nice to get out a bit, isn't it? Indeed. Well, I'm delighted to say that we are joined today by uh, Alistair Stewart, the former chairman of the Croydon Conservative Federation. Alistair, how are you doing? Hi, guys. Uh, I'm really good, thank you. I'm really just glad it's quite cooled down a bit. Uh, much more, much more pleasant at the moment. Excellent. Well, Mike, what are we going to be discussing today? So we've got a Scotland special today. Uh, we've got Alistair here, and we want to talk about some of the things north of the border as we as we sit here in Croydon. So we're talking about COVID in Scotland, the issues with the hires, uh, the new hate speech law, and particularly want to spend some time talking about that. Some of the history of the what the Scottish government's been doing. Take a look at the new Conservative leader of the, Conserv- of the Scottish Tories um, and what's for the future there of Scottish politics generally and look forward to the elections and a possible another Indy ref. Indeed, well, the, the COVID restrictions have been loosened somewhat in England. Uh, hopefully the schools will be back in September, but, uh, but time will tell. But of course, COVID being a public health issue is somewhat devolved to the, the Scottish Parliament, the Welsh Assembly, and indeed the, the Northern Irish Assembly, which is now back in situ. It must be said that it's been a bit confusing from, uh, from a Croydon perspective as to what's been going on up in Scotland. Uh, Nicola Sturgeon seems to want different rules for Scotland than England, uh, with no particular sensible reason, as far as I can see. Uh, for example, gyms reopened in England, uh, I think it was July the 25th, and yet they are still to reopen in Scotland without any sensible explanation, as far as I can understand it. Uh, I don't see any suggestion that the results, if you like, or the, the, the number of deaths per thousand or per million or what have you in Scotland uh, are actually any lower than they, than they are in England. Uh, so I don't really see the justification for it, unless, of course, it's all just part of a, a bigger game from Nicola Sturgeon to try to separate Scotland from England. Alistair, you're our resident Scotsman. What's your take on what the uh, what the Scottish government's been doing in respect to COVID? I think um, for anyone that rightly and sensibly is is not following what each of the devolved administrations might might be doing um, differently to England, um, I think in terms of the approach that Scotland has taken, um, the easiest and simplest way to understand it is to think about what um, Boris and the Westminster government did two or three weeks ago. And that's roughly where Scotland and Nicola Sturgeon uh, will be right now. Um, I think the, the difficulty is, and the cause of so much confusion, is that um, Nicola very much portrays it that uh, Scotland is, is taking a very different route to England. Um, I think the, the greatest um, and simplest explanation of this was the, the criticism of the, the stay safe message um, and um, yeah, it, it, you know, it was then come out with stay alert, and you're like, well, what's the difference? Um, so it's it's yeah, just basically add two or three weeks onto what we're going through in England, and that's pretty much where Scotland is. It does seem somewhat as if Scotland uh, and, and Nicola Surgeon has taken a view that she can always look good if she says we're taking a more cautious approach. It's very hard to criticise someone for doing more health and safety, even if your economy is tanking at the same time. And it does it does feel, you know, politically she's played a very clever game 
of saying, well, they're rushing ahead there in England. I want to take a look at it before I take the next step. And and I, I'm not sure that's actually good for the people of Scotland. I'm sure it's not good for the economy of Scotland. But but I would say politically and, and in terms of the um, the response you see from the public, it does does seem to have play, played out quite well for her. Absolutely. Um, I think there's absolutely no denying that the, the people in Scotland are largely enthralled to what they see as um, Nicola Sturgeon's brilliant handling of, of the crisis. But um, far from it, I think, you know, it, it basically is the English playbook um, delayed by two or three weeks. Um, and I think what we also see is, I guess, the continuing economic irresponsibility of the, the government in Scotland where they want to keep the economy closed down for longer. You, you gave the example of, of gyms um, and they want um, basically English taxpayers to keep paying for it. They, you know, they've, they've been very, very clear. They want the furlough scheme extended because they don't want to reopen the economy. They think it is perfectly feasible and reasonable that we can essentially suspend huge parts of the economy um, for the taxpayer to pick up the bill. Um, and for things to just continue in that state indefinitely, which which obviously isn't the case. No reasonable person really should be thinking like that. But it, it's seen as perfectly reasonable for, for Nicola and other people in Scotland. Do, do people, perhaps people in Scotland don't don't really think about this, I'm not too sure, but obviously you've got a situation where the Scottish Parliament has, has a power, if you like, a power over uh, public health issues. But, but it doesn't have the the accountability as to how it's going to pay for it. Ab- absolutely, and and that basically is is the tension at the heart of this, where they can use their health powers to deep freeze large parts of the Scottish economy, um, and then expect Westminster and others to to pick up the bill. Um, and I think, um, in many respects, the the, the the entire way that coronavirus has been handled in the UK with with different approaches taken by the devolved administrations um, has really highlighted different inconsistencies in terms of you know the the constitutional settlement now in place around the UK um, and actually um, is it sensible that we've had these these different uh, variations and distinctions and messaging and and, and minor differences and the the understandable confusion um, whether it's you know people living on the borders of of England and Wales unsure um, exactly what the restrictions are or indeed you know people hearing the Prime Minister of the UK Boris Johnson going on TV and talking about um, the successes we've had and therefore being able to open up the economy but if you're listening in Scotland of course none of it is relevant to you because um, you know they're, they're just proceeding at a much slower pace. It does strike me there that this is the first time the borders have really meant something for for many, many years, certainly the lifetimes of anyone alive, in that, you know, if you grew up near the border and, and Scotland, England, Wales, what have you, um, it's quite amusing that the border's down the road and you can sort of, you know, step over a line and cross over to another country. But it didn't really mean anything. And I, I know we've had separate laws and, and, and um you know, it, but it's more like it's more akin to moving from one county to another, um, just in terms of what the actual effect is when you go across it. The COVID uh, lockdown and, and, and the crisis we've been in really has been that first major difference on each of those. And and it and as, as Alice has said, there it must be very strange if you live on on those borderlands where uh, there you know it really is a borderland, much like you have across all of continental Europe. Um, you know, for the first time, it's really meaningful. And I sort of think the perhaps the best comparison is with the States. But in the US, it's always meant something when you've moved from one state to another. And and it's something perhaps the people of Britain need to get used to as we continue with the uh, regional assemblies. Well, if we, if we have regional assemblies, I, I know there are some, um, you've got, a, got a Greater Manchester Mirror, et cetera, and there's something something there, but I'm not sure we're going to have full-on regional assemblies. I mean, the last time they, they tried to do that, any, any large scale was, of course, the, the North East referendum for a, a regional assembly in uh, Newcastle and Sunderland, etc. And, uh, of course, that didn't, that didn't go down well when that was a, 
when that was uh, when that, that referendum was held back in the in the late nineties. So um, yeah, but, but it's, a, it's a difficult question though as to as how you would have regional assemblies or indeed uh, better devolution and better local government in England. But yes, it's um, it's a strange one. I know I know some people who live in Wales just to, who would have worked in Chester. Um, I think they have sort of, there's different rules there as well in terms of uh, whether you need to wear masks in shops and uh, when you could go out and when you couldn't go out. And uh, whereas previously the, the difference was, you know, something along the lines of whether, uh, whether prescriptions were free or, or whether, um, whether you, what age you got a, a free bus pass, that sort of thing, uh, rather than anything you know, really life changing, such as uh, not being able to go out at all. Uh, so, yeah, so an, in an interesting perspective there. I think, uh, yes, I think it's, it's really illustrated that there are perhaps elements of, of health policy, like you say, you know, age of, you know, get a free prescription that, that it makes sense to devolve. But in terms of fighting a pandemic, um, it, it probably doesn't make such sense. But I think it's it's really been used as, as a wedge issue, not just by, um, you know, the SNP in Scotland, but also, um, you know, in Wales. But um, I think if you, if you listen to it, you, you often miss some of the, the hard facts behind it. So, for example, you know, the, the European Centre for Disease Prevention um, looked at the numbers of COVID-19 deaths in care homes. And actually across um, Europe, England had one of the, the lowest figures at 21%. Um, this compared to Wales at 25% and a quite frankly horrendous 45% in Scotland. Um, and that compares to other countries like Germany on 37%, Spain on 66 and France on 50%. Um, and yet, if you listen to, to what is being said in the media, um, the, the narrative often is that, that England and Westminster has done a bad job, the devolved administration has done a better job. But actually, um, when, when you start looking into lots of these issues, there are, there are examples everywhere where they've, they've done a pretty terrible job. Um, and often because they've just wanted to, to hammer home differences and take a different approach when, you know, it'd be very surprising for the science to suggest that, that one approach that's valid in England is, is not valid in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Just look, just been looking at this as well. And it, it is interesting that the, you know, what's been the effect of, of what they've done is perceived that Nicola Sturgeon had a had a good war, if you like, during this. Um, it's perceived that Scotland, as, as you say, in fact, they have been more cautious. They've been slower to open up. The death rate now looks higher as a percentage in Scotland than it does in England. Um, you know, I don't know why. And there's not a lot in it, to be honest. And, and I think we know uh, the, the the death rates, uh, how they've counted COVID cases have been, uh, shall we say, suspicious um, and and uh, challenging. But but right now, the, the actual impact of, of of the extra caution that Scotland has taken, hasn't hasn't as you've already alluded there, hasn't really uh, benefited anyone. Yes, and I think um, you know we've we've only seen in the the last few days that you know um, the way that England was counting some coronavirus deaths has has been changed. It's reduced our figure, and we've brought it into line with with how um, some of the devolved administrations were doing it. So. When they continue to change how we calculate the figures and, and how they're put together, um, trying to understand and compare between the, the different nations at this point of the UK is, is really quite difficult. Um, and I think we're probably going to be you know, several months, if not a number of years away, from, from really truly understanding um, what the, the position actually is. Um, I think the, the wider question for me, though, is, is around the excess death figures and the some of the figures very much suggest that actually, you know, there's essentially no change overall in the, the number of deaths happening um, in, in the current weeks compared to what would ordinarily be expected. Um, and yet there's obviously still quite significant restrictions um, on the economy and indeed our, our personal liberties. Um, and it's, it's, it's a really difficult picture, I think, at the moment to, to truly understand. Um, and I think you also need to look at the, the suggestion that the, the public inquiry, which will inevitably um, take place, should or shouldn't um, encompass the, the devolved nations um, and, and should or shouldn't compare to the figures there. Well, I think we would all really benefit um, and gain an understanding that, that when the eventual public inquiry is had, that we should absolutely look at the um, approaches the, the different devolved parts of the UK have taken and make sure that 
each devolved administration isn't just able to, to run their own inquiry and, and set some nice terms of references where they come out smelling of roses, because that is sadly the, the typical approach of, of the SNP. Uh, absolutely. Uh, just on that, that you have this opportunity to say, you know, how we did different things in different parts of the UK. How did they compare in, in a country that's still, you know, we are here talking about the differences, but it's still by and large the same. Um, why on earth wouldn't you want to use that, that that statistical opportunity to go, well, you know, what worked, what didn't work, it's actually panned out. That would seem probably one of the few real benefits that would come out of having an inquiry at all. Well, uh, you mentioned the, how you, uh, you come up with results and uh, how you measure those, those results and how, how things can be uh, interpreted in different ways. And you can have reviews and you can decide who does the review and indeed what the, uh, what the terms of that review are. Well, that brings us very nicely on to another subject that's uh, been, uh, been in the news north of the border. That is the uh, fiasco around the, the hires results. So for our, our English listeners, hires are basically the Scottish equivalent of, of A-levels. And obviously there's been no uh, formal examinations taking place in the spring this year because of the COVID pandemic. So how do you assess uh, the, the students? Well, they went to the, the teachers and the teachers gave predicted grades. And those have been amended somewhat uh, and there's been a bit of a, a scandal up in Scotland because the suggestion has been that if you go to a school that doesn't traditionally do that well in exams but you've been given a very good predicted grade that your grade will have been downgraded uh, based upon the fact that they just don't think you would be doing as well as the teacher said whereas uh, the opposite has happened if you happen to go to a school in a, uh, a more pro perhaps more prosperous area with a with a better results history. Alistair, have you been following this? Yes, I have. And I think um, it's, it's a mess. Um, and I would, I would probably say that that's common really, uh, actually, uh, both the uh, north of the border in Scotland and indeed south of the border um, with, with, you know, the, the A-level results that came out this week. Um, and I think ultimately it comes down to the fact that there just isn't a a good way to deal with it. Um, how do you take into account um, everything that could happen with um, someone's exam performance? Um, people go into exams and um, do far better than expected because of the questions that came up. Um, equally, other people go into exams um, expecting to do well and they just have a really bad day and you know they, they suffer as a result. Um, so how, how do you sort of map those, those predicted grades and, and past performance um, to, to what someone's results should be. And I, I think back on, you know, when I sat my hires in Scotland, um, the, you know, the equivalent of the, the mock exam, I, I failed my higher physics. I eventually got a B in it um, because it, it gave me the kick up the backside to, 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 you know, actually go and sort that out. Um, and so there'll be a huge number of people in Scotland who, who are probably in that position of nothing to, to fall back on and, and haven't had the opportunity to sit an exam and, and hopefully improve where they were. But um, we, we now seem to be in a position where um, after the, the education minister in, in Scotland stood firm for, for five days effectively and refused to, to make any changes, he then did a complete U-turn and gave in. Um, pretty much because he expected that um, there, was, there was going to be a no confidence motion in the Scottish Parliament, which indeed there was. Um, and the, the SNP did not quite have a majority there. And there was a, a very significant risk that the Greens, who pop up um, and prop up the SNP, um, would, would have voted with Labour and everyone else um, in that no confidence motion. So, um, Q, about face, complete U turn, um, gave in. Um, everyone's grades are, are going to be increased and um, as I understand it it now means that you know the, the highest percentage of pupils pretty much ever are now going to get top grades so um, what does that do for, for people who, who sat um, exams in previous years and will sit them in future years um, I think you know there's there's no right way to deal with it and it has been and continues to be an utter mess I have to say, I've never understood why you don't grade to a curve. Um, uh, you know, and and in 20 years ago, 
you know, 5% get an A in um, A level history or highest history in this case. And 20 years for, you know, now 5% get. And, and that way, if you'd gone ahead with the exams and said, well, it's, you know, it's unfair because they all missed five months school. It's not unfair. They all missed five months school. It, you still grade to the curve. And that, that would would get round a lot of this and it, and it would get round a lot of the dumbing down of exams. Um, there's no, in, there's no incentive to make the exams easier. Uh, if, if all you do is grade to a curve anyhow. Um, and, and that does strike me as a fair comparison between people of the same generation. Um, because it, it, it isn't, you know, you're not really comparing people between generations normally in terms of their exam results. But, no, but I think, I think employers, will be though you know the, the the problem with this is that employers who look at um pupils this year um they they will really struggle to understand how people would and should have actually performed and if you look at the overall pass rate for hires in scotland um in 2019 it was 75 percent. so one in four people um would fail their hire this year the pass rate will now sit at 89.2%. So that's a huge increase. You know, 14% more people um, have been given a passing grade because of the U-turn. And equally, the advanced hires, which um, are this strange, um, easily and most easily considered somewhere sitting between an, an A-level and a first-year university course, the pass rate is now 93%. Um, that's up um, from 80% last year. So if, if I was an employer and, and looking at these, these grades in Scotland um, and I had someone who, who got an A this year or even a C this year and someone in a previous year who got, you know, a, a grade, how, how do you compare them? You, 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 there, there's just no realistic way to compare them because they're, they're quite frankly, the, the way they've changed it now after the U-turn is just as made up as, as the way it was made up five, six days ago before the U-turn. No, I couldn't agree with you more. That's that's what I mean. I think if you grade to a curve, each year has a consistency in the sense that the top 5% of the top 5%, the 25%, you know, the bottom third of the bottom third every year, if you like. But no, you, you, you've hit the nail on the head. I mean, this this year's exams are completely devalued. And the greatest sympathy goes to those pupils who, frankly, you know, aren't necessarily naturally gifted, but have worked incredibly hard and now they found it, that they've got a, a, I'm not quite sure how these are graded, I must confess, but you know, they've got kind of a B, um, having put in a huge amount of effort, along with frankly everyone else who didn't put in the effort because they've just been yeah. upgraded. Um, the, approach, the, the approach the governments, both north and south of the border took, struck me as probably the fairest way you can do it without having an exam. Although therein lies some of the problem. They scrapped the exams incredibly quickly um this year uh, you know as soon as, as soon as the lockdown started exam exams by their very nature are socially distanced um it's turned out that that children are particularly unaffected by covid um it and and exams can happen over a number of days they do already happen often sort of some in classrooms some in halls and and you can separate groups of people it would have been quite possible to hold the exams had the government just held fire on that decision for six weeks, which would have still given them four months to sort it out. Uh, and again, true both north and south of the border. Um, there's a good chance we, they could have actually got around this problem. Um, they didn't, and, and, and now we've gone from, you know, an unfair but probably the most fairest way to sort it out given what's happened to, to a complete mess, really. Yes, and I think for me the the most disheartening um, aspect of, of all this is that there was there was some polling done um, in the middle of the the unfolding education uh, grading uh, disaster in Scotland, which showed that the the SNP's polling was pretty much unchanged. Um, I think this goes back to the the wider problem that that exists in Scotland is that. Essentially, it doesn't matter how much the government in Scotland messes up. Um, they will not get hit for it in the polls because far too many people are just this single-minded um, desire for, for independence overrules everything else. 
and it just leads to, to bad decisions and, and bad politics because no one is ever held to account for, for what they're doing and the decisions they make because they know they can change it. Their voters aren't going to care. Um, and it, it, it never encourages people to, to take any responsibility or even have to think things through. Um, it, it, it's just, yeah, the political situation in Scotland is, is truly quite depressing. Well, you, you mentioned about um, having an, an inquiry into the COVID uh, crisis at some point in the future. Well, the, uh, the aforementioned education minister in Scotland, John Swinney, has announced that there will be a review of the, of the qualifications uh, the scenario that, that, that developed. And he has appointed somebody called Mark Priestley, who's an education professor at the University of Stirling, to carry out that review. Interestingly, this uh, Mr. Mark Priestley uh, actually endorsed the SNP via his Twitter account. That's a Twitter account that has one of those EU flags in it um, at the last general election. And yet he, notwithstanding that, he has been given this position to carry out review into the SNP government's handling of this debacle. Well, it, it's far from the first time that... Um the the SNP administration has um, shall we say appointed people who are likely sympathetic to their um, political position um, and I, I forget exactly who it was but um, one of the the civil servants who is is meant to be supporting the Scottish Parliament or Scottish government with um, health advice and health information which in the middle of a like a, you know a coronavirus pandemic you know might want to be interacting with other parliamentarians, um, decided to, to block a fairly senior Scottish um, Conservative MSP when, when they raised some, you know, important questions about um, the information and situation in Scotland. So it is, it is far from unusual in Scottish politics that um, there, there is a, an, an increasing bias and partisan appointments um, where um, people are appointed based on their ability to produce the the results and the the right result in the eyes of the administration, rather than to actually do a a proper independent um, impartial job. Well, you you mentioned there about people perhaps being put in a position because you you know what they're going to uh, they're going to come up with a correct result from the the government's perspective. Uh, perhaps you should move on to a situation where people say things which are not something that the government would agree with. The, the, the Scottish government is wanting to bring in some further hate crime legislation. Okay, sounds reasonable on the surface. But unfortunately, it does appear that they're going to curtail free speech quite, uh, quite rigorously. Mike, what have you made of this? Yes, the, uh, it's part of the relentless drive, isn't it, that, that we see from from big tech, from uh, sort of societal pressure, through employers, and and through the law over uh, the last number of years, and and quite a, a strict implementation of the law um, from the police, generally, and I'm, I'm talking, you know, certainly in Britain, but but I think in other parts of the world as well, um, to to make it harder and harder to speak and and to treat words as as actions rather than words. Um, this this law though really does seem to have blown up, and and some of the 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 ways in which the my uh, and I would say unlegal qualification, uh, or sorry, unlegal interpretation of it, whereby you know it's all about offence rather than what you've actually said. There's no measure of what you've said or what you've done. Um, is is really is a problem. Um, so I don't know. I don't know what what's going to be the outcome of how it gets implemented but certainly there's a huge concern here that they are passing something that is is frankly taking it to the next level from a few unfortunate cases to it to really criminalizing an awful lot of what would otherwise be normal speech yeah well it seems to to me that they're wanting to take out the concept of intent so for example you you know we have generally have legislation so that you can't incite racial hatred, for example. That's been on the statute books for, for quite some time. But this seems to be all about offence and, and the intent of the person using the language now seems to be irrelevant, according to this bit of legislation. Alistair, what's your take on it? 
Well, I think I think you've hit the the nail on the head there, Dan. Um, that is exactly the the main issue and I think main concern that many people have with the Hate Crime and Public Order Scotland Bill, which um, somehow the the SNP administration had time to publish in April 2020. Not like there's anything more important for them to be dealing with. But yes, as you say, um, the the removal of intent. Um, you only now need to prove. Um, essentially hatred in relation to a particular protected characteristic, um, and I'm quoting, is likely to be stirred up thereby. Um, so um, how and who defines that, that hatred is likely to be stirred up um, is, is always problematic when we have um, the police and CPS and, and everyone else involved. Um, I think, interestingly enough, the, the legislation is only starting with racial hatred, but it is expected to extend uh, to encompass essentially all groups. Um, so that would be hatred towards age, disability, religion, sexual orientation, transgender identity, and variation of sex characteristics. Um, I think that, you know, there's just so many problems that, that people have started to identify um, with, this, with this bill. But I think uh, one of the, you know, um, clearest and simplest illustrations I can provide is that um, in, in many people's uh, views, it could criminalize um, orthodox religious views, which are held by different people of, you know, Christian, Jewish, um, or within Muslim communities. Um, but don't worry, there's a specific exemption from the bill if you want to criticize religious views. Um, so we're, we, we, we could end up in a position where where people who genuinely hold um, certain religious views are unable to express them because of their their fear of, of being caught up in this. But if you want to criticize those views, you can you can happily go right ahead. Um, so again, I, I use the word mess to describe um, what is coming out of the, the Scottish government so far around this bill. Yes, and it's uh, certain celebrities have, have come out against it, most noticeably uh, Rowan Atkinson, because um, there seems to be some concern, obviously, that if you, you can't criticise <laughs> certain people, that's going to uh, make comedy quite difficult, I would imagine. Um, but also, there's suggestions from various bishops that it may even become an offence to, to possess a Bible, because in theory, there are certain parts of the Bible which could be considered to be inflammatory. Um, for example, certain aspects of the Old Testament in relation to, to homosexuality, you know, as one example. Um, surely that, that can't be the, well, I'm going to say surely it can't be the intention of the SNP to do that. But as, as we've said, the, the intent or, and, and the context of these things it seems to be irrelevant within the Act. Yes, um, I think uh, we, we know from past experience, though, that the, the SNP and Scottish Government are quite used to... Uh, badly drafting bills and, and sadly past experience shows they aren't very good at taking criticism and, and correcting the issues and unless forced to do so by a quote. Uh, but no, I mean, you're quite right. I mean, Owen Atkinson um, has been committed to, to free speech for, for many years now. And um, there's there's a great clip um, of him circulating on, on Twitter um, where, where he sort of talks about the, the new but intense desire to gag uncomfortable voices of dissent, which I think this bill um, absolutely would do. And he, he, he best illustrates it by um, suggesting that there's a certain part of, of society who would happily claim that I'm not intolerant. I'm only intolerant of intolerance. Um, and it, it again comes down to, well, well, who decides what is acceptable or not? Um, and, you know, Rowan Atkinson's view is very clear that for him, the best way to increase society's resistance to insulting or offensive speech is to allow more, a lot more of it. And I think that's absolutely true. Um, it goes back to the, the discussions and issues around the sort of snowflake society that, that people just simply can't handle any criticism or any offence. Um, and I think, um, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's really risking a, a dangerous route. Um, I think, you know, there's some very loud and, and you know, important voices about the, the bill that is being proposed. Um, in Scotland. One of those is Amanda Miller, the, the president of the Law Society of Scotland, who has made clear that the Law Society have significant reservations regarding a number of the, the bill's provisions and the lack of clarity, um, which could lead to restrictions on freedom of expression, which they consider to be one of the free foundations of a democratic society. And they do have real concerns that certain behaviour, the views expressed, or even an actor's performance 
um, could well be deemed insulting or offensive and could result in a criminal conviction under the terms of the bill as currently drafted. And that was perhaps best illustrated by the suggestion that um, the, the old sort of stereotypical joke of a Scotsman, an Englishman and an Irishman walk into a bar um, could be outlawed by the new bill because it, it's, it's perfectly feasible and reasonable to, to read into the bill that that kind of thing could be banned and, and now illegal. Indeed, you can just imagine the, the performance of, of various plays could be could be illegal. I mean, you just think about some of the language in To Kill a Mockingbird, for example, something like that. You know, this this could be this could be banned because somebody could, in theory, take offence, possibly on someone else's behalf. But but you know, but they could do. You know, you know, ban Mark Twain books and things like that. You know, it's um it's craziness. And of course, you know what's what's acceptable twenty years ago is is no longer acceptable now. It seems so. So Lord knows how they'll how they'll deal with this, but you know, I mean, there's a bit of a history here, isn't there, of uh, Nana Nicola knowing best. Uh, we've seen in the last few years certain things they've uh, tried to introduce. Mike, I know you're particularly keen on the uh, the SNP's policy of minimum alcohol pricing. Yes, so a uh, little bit of a, a, a thing I don't know I've shared particularly on this podcast before. One of the reasons I joined UKIP some years ago now, uh, obviously subsequently left, but. Um, was was because the Conservative government in this country was thinking of bringing minimum alcohol uh, pricing. And I contacted my then local MP and expressed concern about this, who then tried to justify it to me, saying that, you know, it's it's we, we do need to control people uh, effectively. And, and, and over the course of the evening that we had an email exchange, I found myself joining a party in opposition to him. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, this is, look, if... if Government should tax uh, externalities problems. Um, if, if drinking alcohol means that people are uh, creating havoc and causing, causing problems or there's a, there's a cost to it, absolutely, government should raise the tax on that. If they're bringing in minimum alcohol pricing, all they're doing is saying, we don't like poor people drinking, we want to stop them, um, and we're going to make our buddies in the, the, the drinks industry rich in the process. Um, or indeed the, the retail industry. And that's, I think, you know, immoral in government deciding how we get to live our lives and immoral in the way that they're, they're exploiting, you know, frankly, poor members of society to benefit, frankly, rich members of society. Um, and, 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 but, but, you know, they're doing it with a smile on their face. And they're doing it because they, they know how better you should live your life than you do. Um, and and it, it comes on the back of the hate speech where it's, it is, again, this thing of, it, you know, it, you're free to do what you want, but oh, I didn't like that, so we're going to stop that bit, or we're going to stop that bit, and and it's just a, another trait of that. Something we've seen quite a lot, I think, with the SNP, the, the name Person Act, which, which thankfully sort of uh, uh, went away, but was was kind of another good example of that of them just uh, taking a view that that Nanny knows best. Uh, yes, I entirely agree with with everything you just you just said, Mike. Um, I think. As with with many um, of these attempts to, you know, change the the way that the people live their lives, it has lots of unintended consequences. The the legislation in terms of minimum alcohol pricing was basically designed to stop the the really high strength two liter bottles of cider that you could buy really cheaply, um, in lots of convenience stores and news agents, um, and that you know would result in often. Um, you know, youths in, in parks causing antisocial behaviour and, and upsetting uh, residents and, and neighbours, quite understandably so. Um, sadly, the, the normal pricing in Scotland has pushed up the, the price of all alcohol, you know, whether it's wine um, or indeed spirits such as gin. Um, on, a, on a personal level, um, it's worked out quite well for me because uh, when I travel up to Scotland every Christmas, um, I make sure to, to fill the, the boot of my car with quite a few different bottles and I get to gift them to all my friends and family who are much more appreciative of, of getting, um, you know, a, a bottle of spirit or, or some alcohol because um, quite frankly, um, it costs me a lot less in England to buy it than it does for them now in Scotland. Um, and I think the, the, the worst thing of, of all this is that the, the Scottish government and other people in Scotland consider it a, a huge success. Um, they, they've managed to um, reduce by 3.6% the amount of pure alcohol sold per person in Scotland. Um, it is now down to 7.1 litres per year um, in Scotland compared to uh, six and a half litres 
in England. So um, if their intention is to, to continue to reduce it and, and maybe reduce Scotland's level to England, they've, they've got an awful lot, long way to go. Um, and I'm pretty certain that when it comes to reviewing the minimum pricing level um, in, in the next year or so, um, the only answer from the SNP government is going to be, well, it's not been successful enough, we'll have to push up the price again. And, and as you say, that will only hit the, the hardest, uh, the poorest in society, who will, who will simply, quite frankly, continue to spend an ever-increasing proportion of their income um, on alcohol, which is, is understandable. People should be able to have a, a, a nice drink every now and then, um, at the expense of other things that they should be spending their money on, um, and funding the, the retailers and, and alcohol producers, um, as you explained. Well, Alistair, you mentioned uh, earlier that it seems that the SNP is nonetheless, notwithstanding all the things we've talked about today, does still seem to be quite popular in the polls. Um, but there's been a few, there's been some changes in the, in the Conservative Party makeup in, uh, in Holyrood recently. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about what's been going on and about the new Scottish Tory leader? Yes, well... Um... I was thinking about this, and, and strangely enough, um, I've actually lived in, in both the, the Scottish constituencies that the uh, the last two Scottish Conservative leaders have held and come from. So um, that is uh, Maury, where um, Douglas Ross, the, the new leader, um, currently has his Westminster seat, and Eastwood, the, the seat that was held um, by Jackson Carlow. So yes, um, Jackson Carlow, who, who was the acting leader and then leader of the Conservative Party for, for just less than a year, um, has thankfully, finally, um, understood that he um, had absolutely no hope at all um, of A, leading the Conservatives to a good result um, in the next Scottish Parliament elections, um, or indeed uh, no hope at all of, of convincing um, the rest of Scotland that perhaps um, staying in the Union and unionism is a good thing. Um, I mean, I, I've, I've met Jackson Carlow a, a number of times. Um, you know, he's a perfectly uh, lovely man, you know, um, intelligent and, and all the good things you'd expect of a politician. Um, but sadly, it's pretty much absolutely no charisma. Um, and I would also, um, I would probably just you know, point to his record um, in trying to win a, a constituency seat in Scotland. Um, so he tried um, to win um, the, the Eastwood um, constituency seats um, in 2003, 2007 and 2011 and he failed each time. Um, he was finally successful on his fourth attempt in 2016. Now um, I'm sure most listeners are not at all familiar with, with what the Eastwood seat is so I shall steal the, the Wikipedia description which calls it a highly affluent middle-class commuter seat located in the southwest of Glasgow. And quite frankly, is exactly the kind of seat that Conservatives would expect to win all over the UK. The fact that it took him four attempts um, when Labour had essentially disappeared in Scotland um, you know, to win a seat that, quite frankly, the Conservatives should have held um, you know, well before that um, really shows how out of touch um, he was. In fact, he was never going to be able to reach out across Scotland to build the kind of electoral coalition needed um, to stop the SNP getting a majority in the Scottish Parliament and indeed fight that independence referendum. So um, I always thought he was the, the wrong leader um, for the Scottish Conservatives and I'm, I'm very glad to have seen him leave. So what's the actual position then at the moment? Because look, the new leader of the Scottish Conservative Party isn't actually in the Scottish Parliament, is he? No. Um, so this is the, the really unusual situation we, we find ourselves in. So um, Douglas Ross, um, who actually used to be in the Scottish Parliament um, and is now um, only in the Westminster Parliament. Um, he, he did a brilliant thing. He managed to, to unseat the SNP's Angus Robertson in 2017 um, and he overturned um, his majority, which was which about 9,000, 9, I think, at the time, um, and then held on to the seat again in, in 2019. So um, when, when he won that seat for the first time in 2017, um, Douglas Ross decided... Uh, very understandably, to, to step down from the Scottish Parliament um, and to, to only hold the, the Westminster seat. Um, a very different approach, I'll, I'll add, to, to what many SNP politicians, including their old leader, Alex Salmond, I think he held both a Scottish Parliament and Westminster Parliament seat for about seven years um, in total at one point. And um, yes, so, so Douglas Ross was, was essentially um, elected unopposed to the role. Um, and he's certainly very different to um, the previous leaders. He's an independent man. He's prepared to diverge from the Conservative Party line um, 
quite publicly, um, including quite recently, over um, the whole issue with Dominic Cummings and, and his his travels um, during the coronavirus pandemic. Um, I do hope, though, that perhaps um, Douglas Ross doesn't diverge as much as uh, Ruth Davidson used to um, when she was leader. Uh, but I think you know some some level of divergence from the the wider UK Conservative Party is needed in Scotland. There does need to be that unique um, identity. Um, what will hopefully win win some kudos and credits um, with with you, Mike and Dan, is that uh, Douglas Ross um, did he he did support Remain um, in Brexit, but uh, then uh, after the result was very clear that the Westminster Parliament had to done over the will of the British people, and most importantly, he did oppose Theresa May's Brexit deal. Um, which is certainly um, a, another tick um, uh, from my side. Um, he, he's demonstrated he can win big swings against the SNP, you know, managing to, to unseat um, their, their, their leader or deputy leader in, in, in Westminster, um, Angus Robertson, was, was a great result. Um, but yes, um, it does also mean that there's the return of, of Ruth Davidson, um, who will have the, the awkward and, and interesting role in, in the party now as, as Hollywood leader. Um, having led the Scottish Conservatives for a number of years very successfully um, and having decided that she would indeed stand down um, at the next um, Scottish elections um, in May 2021 and, and go to the House of Lords, um, she now finds herself back on um, you know, the, the front bench um, and very much in a very public role where she'll be um, hopefully holding Nicola Sturge and another SNP politicians to account at First Minister's questions and everything every week because um, Douglas Ross won't be able to. And I think there'll be a really interesting challenge for him in how he maintains that media profile um, without the ability to be seen in, in the Scottish Parliament, you know, week on, week out, and, and speaking. Um, and, and that probably will be a challenge for him, but one I, I very much hope he's successful at. So do you know who the last person, the last deputy leader was to lead uh, the opposition in the Scottish Parliament whilst the leader was an MP in Westminster? I don't actually. I'm. I'm not sure. Um... That was Nicola Sturgeon. Whilst Alex Salmon was an MP in Westminster before he got back into the or got into the Scottish Parliament um, yeah. some years ago. <laughs> yes. I, I, I was. I was thinking that um, it was. It was possibly either Alex Salmon or even Jim Murphy, who I think at one point was uh, the Scottish Labour leader, um, despite being a Westminster politician. So um, yes, I, I was trying to work out. Um, who else it might be. I mean, there's certainly other examples of it. Um, yeah. Nicholas Sturgeon is perhaps the only su successful one. <laughs> well, indeed, absolutely. Uh, yeah, no, she, and, and, and so it's not entirely unprecedented in terms of how that's happened, which is just in itself quite interesting. You mentioned about a uh, change of identity up there. Certainly I heard um, uh, him being asked this week, whether the, the party should change its name, which seems to be an idea going around uh, to just sort of the Unionist Party rather than the Scottish Conservatives. Any thoughts on, on the benefits or not of a, of a name change or, a, or a striking out quite a separate identity? So, yes, I mean, this has been an issue that um, the Scottish Conservatives have, have had internal debate and division about for, for quite some time. And... At, you know, at the point, I think it was um, when Jackson Carlow uh, was, was competing, um, there was certainly the, the very open question about should the party actually split entirely um, from the, the rest of the Conservative Party and have an, an entirely independent um, party in Scotland. Um, I think the, you know, the parallels between the, the Scottish Conservatives splitting from the Conservatives while trying to argue that Scotland should remain in the UK would would make it a rather difficult argument to make. Um, so I'm quite glad that that has been defeated. And I think that's that's ultimately the problem they have, that um, the greater they try to suggest the Scottish um, Conservatives needs needs independence from the rest of the Conservative Party, well, you're effectively writing the the SNP um, attack scripts for them. Um, and that the party has long been criticised for the fact that, um, you know, that the Scottish Conservatives um, isn't actually its own party. It's effectively a branch of the Conservative Party. There is no official position in terms of the, the Electoral Commission of, of, of the Scottish Conservative leader, um, in terms of it being a political party, and um, they've often been criticised for that. Um, so I, I really don't think that, um, you know, trying to create a, a bigger gap or, or distance between the Scottish Conservatives and the, the rest of the party um, is, is really a very sensible route to pursue. They, they do already have um, a fairly distinct identity. They use a, a different logo. 
um, and um, Ruth Davidson certainly adopted very different positions um, quite successfully, um, as I'm sure Douglas Ross will. So I think it's it's really difficult for them, and I think they've probably found the the right sort of middle ground at the moment, and hopefully they'll stay there. And it, it does, as I think about it, it would it would be actually quite a disservice to the people of Scotland when you think roughly half the time Labour's in power, roughly half the time the Conservatives are in power. If the, if the people of Scotland didn't have an opportunity to vote for or be represented by uh, a Conservative government for h- half the time, you know, they have no representation from that government, that would be a, a huge disservice to the, to the people of Scotland if they were only ever a sort of a junior partner in a coalition or anything like that. Spot on. Spot on. Um, yeah. I mean, I think there's there's so many issues though with with the the political position in 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 Scotland, and it's uh, I think the the difficulties between the Scottish Conservatives and the the wider Conservative Party um, is is not unique to the Conservatives. Indeed, um, we've seen division and, and differences in, in in the Labour Party more recently. Um, indeed, in last year. Um, there was quite a, a public spat between the, the then Labour deputy leader, Tom Watson, um, who was saying Scotland um, and, and Labour absolutely should oppose a separate or a second um, Scottish independence referendum. Um, whereas the then Shadow Chancellor, John McDonnell, was, was saying no, that the Labour Party absolutely um, shouldn't, shouldn't block a second vote. So um, it's really across the political divide that you see um, this this real challenge of um, you know having a, a common um, common agreed position and making sure that people stick to that script as it were. Uh, but I think on the whole, the Scottish Conservatives and the Conservative more widely is is much more um, on message um, and clear and um, agreed in its position um, than any of other parties in Scotland. Whether you look at the Labour, Liberal Democrats, um, or, or really anyone else. What's happening at the moment with the the Labour Party in Scotland? They don't seem to be doing very well in the polls. No, and I I think that very much um, is reflected of of the real split in in the Labour Party about how to approach the whole independence question, as as I just mentioned, in terms of the the spat between Tom Watson and and John McDonnell. Um, I think also it's very interesting the Scottish Labour leader, um, Richard Leonard, um, I actually can't remember the last time I, I heard him mentioned in the, in the media down, down in England, but um, maybe um, other listeners and others are, are better informed. Um, and interestingly enough, um, his view as the Scottish Labour leader um, is that he would be rather in favour of another independence vote, as long as there was a federal UK option on the ballot paper. Um, interestingly enough, Keir Starmer has at least been much clearer, um, saying there absolutely shouldn't be. Um, any second independence referendum but again it goes back to the, the muddled and mixed messages um, and, and particularly when Labour politicians can't have a, a clear and agreed position on the single most significant issue facing Scottish voters in 2020 I think there are chances of a recovery soon either in polls or in terms of the number of politicians elected um, is, is almost nil I think it's it's also very interesting to think, um, you know, about who Richard Leonard is himself. I mean, he's essentially someone in the mould of Jeremy Corbyn. And despite the rest of the UK, and indeed Scotland, making it quite clear it wanted nothing to do with Corbyn's socialist policies, on Labour in Scotland seemed to be determined to continue down that path, um, despite the fact they were just as equally rejected in Scotland in December, um, which left the Labour with only a single Scottish MP. It's it's rather interesting. You, you say Richard Leonard there. Now I, I thought to myself, despite having prepped for this uh, podcast um, and and being fairly averse, uh, you know, well versed in politics, I don't think under torture I could have told you Richard Leonard's name. I've just pulled him up on my computer and I see a photo of him, and I'm I'm confident I've never seen that face before. Um, that you know that just gives an indication of the impact he's uh, obviously had, um, uh, which is not very much. It, it's interesting you mentioned sort of him being Corbynista, and I wonder how much this plays out. I, I'm not aware of in Scottish politics the, the, the case being put by any of the parties of how they plan to use the, um, uh, the, the parliament to actually build the economy or change the economy or change rights or, 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 or you know, 
anything it might be that the government can do up there, how they actually intend to improve things for the, the lives of ordinary Scots. Now, that may be distance that, that, that means I don't know that, but, but even going back to sort of the first part of the, this century where I was, spent an awful lot of time in Scotland with work, um, I rarely heard uh, Scottish uh, MSPs saying what they were going to do for the people of Scotland. What I tended to hear was was kind of what they didn't like about the government in London. Um, and, and, and obviously that over time became more about what they thought about independence. But, but I, you know, certainly a Corbynista you think can't do it. Maybe, maybe uh, the Scottish Conservatives can, but I don't know what your thoughts are. What have they actually delivered for the people of Scotland? How have they got the economy going up there? What, what can you say, look, you know, this is something they've done that's really been a benefit of having the devolved powers? Well, I think um, that that really is the, I guess, the, the £10 billion question, um, which is the amount of money that the, the rest of the UK uh, and really London and South East subsidises um, Scotland with every single year. And I, I've never really heard um, any sort of coherent case for, for what Scotland would do differently and better to, to improve the economy. Um, it is very much the, the anti-Westminster rhetoric um, that you mentioned, Mike. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a real challenge. And I think, um, you know, you only need to look at, um, you know, how Scotland has recovered from the, the financial crash and the recession from, from 2008. And it's, it, it never recovered as, as well as, as England or, or the rest of the UK had. They, they, were, they were behind the curve. And they, they have many of the, the levers and a lot of the, the policy decisions and, and the decisions they've taken is to, to tax businesses more to tax individuals more with higher income tax rates. Um, and quite frankly, the, the environment for businesses in, in Scotland um, is, is, is poor. You know, you're, you're, you're much better off as, as an individual or a businessman to, to move your, your business or start your business in the rest of the UK now than, than you are in Scotland. And I think um, that's really reflected um, in, in the really muddled kind of political picture we, we now see in Scotland. Um, there's essentially two clear camps and, and everyone else is, is stuck in, in no man's land. Um, the SNP, um, you know, are clearly pro-independence and have now settled on being left-wing, having flirted a bit more with, with the centre or even centre-right under, under previous leaders. Um, and you've got the Conservatives are equally clear in their positioning as being pro-union and centre-right. I mean, the, the Scottish Conservatives have never been... Um, as, as, as right wing as, as the rest of the Conservative Party, Scotland as a whole has always been a bit more centrist and left wing and the sort of Conservative position reflects that. And, and that then essentially leaves Labour, the, the Lib Dems and Greens in Scotland fighting over essentially the rest of the left wing vote. Um, and interesting enough, none of the parties there really support the, the current status quo or devolution and constitutional settlement. Um, you've got the likes of the pro-independence Greens the sort of pro-federalism Labour, or at least the Scottish Labour leader, if not the, the leader of the Labour Party in the UK, and pro-federalism Lib Dems. Um, I think one, one interesting development could actually be with the the current national UK-wide Liberal Democrat leader election. Um, Liam Moran, one of the two candidates there to be the next Lib Dem leader, has said that the party needs to make the emotional case for the union in order to win back Scottish votes, You know, very much recognising that this sort of uh, no man's land that they occupy at the moment is, is certainly not going to help their recovery. Um, but I think it just reflects the fact that, that everything in Scotland is viewed through a, a pro-union or pro-independence um, perspective and it leaves very little time, energy or, 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 or capacity for people to consider the wider questions about um, who might be able to make the economy better, to improve education, improve health outcomes, which um, under the SNP, you know, education attainment's gone down, the economy hasn't done as well, and, and yet it, it never really gets the attention it deserves. And it's, it's interesting, yeah, and it's kind of, you've summarised what, what I'd, I'd thought, and perhaps with, without the knowledge that you, you bring to it, and, and it's 13 years almost now, I think, the SNP have been in power, something like that. And, and the financial crash, I was working up in Scotland an awful lot before the financial crash, in Edinburgh, didn't necessarily see so much of the rest of the country, I have to admit. Um, but Edinburgh was a, a thriving city, uh, lots of big banks and and associated industries up there. Obviously, that that went pretty much overnight, um, uh, particularly the one I was working for. But <laughs> there we go. 
Um, and, and you'd have thought in that time the SNP may have, being a more left-wing party, said, right, okay, we want to bring some heavy industry back. We're going we're gonna to direct government funds to, uh, you know, heavy industries or, or to, in partnership with the Greens, to new green industries. Uh, we think we need, you know, lots of public transport to get people around and get them to jobs, whatever it might be. Now, they're not necessarily policies I would agree with. I think you, you get out of the way and business will flourish. But, but fine, that's, they're in power. If they'd done something like that, you could say at least they've done something, whether it worked or not. Um, it just strikes me that, that at no point has anyone sort of done anything, um, which has got to be a huge detriment because, you know, an awful lot of that responsibility has been removed from the, the, the UK government, so they're not doing it. Um, the local government there are, are, are frankly too busy, you know, virtue signalling or whatever party, uh, you know, or, or, or signalling around the uh, independence issue, so they're not doing it. Um, I'm going to put a controversial point to you. For Scotland's economy to recover, maybe they do need a, a, a clean break and uh, a chance to um, revive themselves when they realise the money isn't being coming their way anymore. Well, I mean, I, th I think that's, that's a really interesting um, point, and I think a lot of the, the argument around independence of the union often is, is about the, the £10 billion pounds that um, the rest of the, the UK essentially subsidises Scotland with. Um, and I, I don't think the, the economic argument is, is the way to fight independence. Um, we obviously saw in the Brexit referendum that, um, you know, the, the figures that were thrown around in terms of, um, you know, the fact that we were actually paying in to the European Union, but that the, the economic benefits to us as a country were, were so high that we'd make ourselves poorer. And, and people, you know, whether that is, is right or, or, or wrong, and there's, there's a lot of arguments to be had there, essentially, you know, put two fingers up to the politicians and said, I don't care if I make us pure, we want to be an independent country. And I think we essentially risk that, that same thing happening in Scotland. Um, so indeed, I, I don't think an economic argument is the way to win the independence or union argument. So I probably would um, remove the, the 10 billion pound subsidy. I'd resolve um, the Barnet formula issues. I would make it uh, much more focused on, on population and the needs of the population to make sure that the, the funding goes to help those around the UK where it's really needed and, and force the Scottish government to actually start making some really tough decisions because when they can't throw around free prescriptions and free university education and free bus passes and free everything else that they, they love to, to use in elections, it, it may just create that space to, to actually have those conversations about what actually makes sense uh, for for the economy. And because they can rely um, on, on the rest of the UK to prop them up, and I, I really must criticise something David Cameron did um, when, when he was a uh, Prime Minister. Um, one of the, the sort of updated devolution settlements um, had the most ridiculous provision that um, if uh, population and income tax um, in England increased um, more than it did in Scotland, we would, we would give um, some of that shared increase in the income tax, tax income in England to Scotland, which is a complete disincentive for Scotland to have to even think about, um, you know, what its economy or is, is doing or isn't doing, because they know that they can sit pretty, do whatever they want, and, you know, England will take the tough decisions, England will create the environment to, to grow jobs, grow businesses, and Scotland gets to benefit from share for that for, for doing absolutely nothing. Well, of course, one of the major economic arguments that the SNP put forward at the, uh, the previous independence referendum was that they could pay for all of these things uh, because of North Sea oil. But of course, the price of oil has crashed completely since then. So, so, and yet, notwithstanding the fact that the, the one half decent economic argument, if you like, has, has gone away, they do seem to be doing better in the polls. And, and some polls are suggesting there's now even a small majority uh, in favour of, of independence. So I think perhaps you're right, Alistair, it's not, just, it's not good enough to just put the economic arguments, by all means do, and they are very real, but nonetheless, it does seem to be more of a, now becoming more of an emotional, uh, an emotional argument, I think. Yes, I, I think it has to be the emotional argument, and um, it, it's good that the politicians like 
Liam and Ryan are recognising that's possibly one of the few things I do agree with uh, Leila and the, the Liberal Democrats on at the moment. Um, and I, I do think that um, within the Conservative Party there perhaps is just um, a rather blinkered approach and, and thinking at the moment to what's happening in Scotland. Um, at, the, at the start of 2020, before um, coronavirus um, was afflicting the, the UK, there was actually a poll of, of MPs done. And um, I think very interestingly is that when MPs were asked, um, you know, do you think Scotland will vote to become an independent country by 2030? 68% of Labour MPs thought it would, and only 10% of Conservative MPs um, agreed with that. Uh, sadly, on this issue, I, I think Labour are right. Um, I think um, there's, you know, the, the, the polls are pretty consistent now that there is a majority in Scotland for independence. If I look at my peers who are a similar age to me and that I grew up with, um, there are very few, very few of them um, who um, support the union, which is which is very sad, and I, I think it's probably almost inevitable that, that Scotland is going to be independent. So I think the the sooner, in many respects, that um, the politicians start accepting that, start planning for it, and and or maybe even doing a complete U-turn in their approach and seeing what they can stop it would be good. Um, but um, unless we're going to rely on the fact that we think there's going to be a Boris Johnson or Conservative administration for the next decade and therefore um, we're simply going to say no and continue to refuse a second referendum. I, I, I really don't see how we, we keep Scotland part of the union. Because it looks as if there's going to be an actual SNP majority uh, in the Scottish Parliament after the elections next year, according to the, the most recent polls. Um, at the moment, as you said, you mentioned earlier, they're, they're relying technically on two... Scottish Green MSPs to actually provide them with a with a majority uh, at present, but it looks like they'll probably have an actual majority, and of course they'll then presumably look to demand a indie ref too. Um, if they've got that that majority, is there any way that Boris Johnson can refuse? I, I think he absolutely can refuse. Um, I think there will be howls of of anger and and all sorts of issues coming out of Scotland. But, um, you know, um, there was the Edinburgh Agreement at the last uh, Scottish Independence referendum, which said that there wouldn't be another one a century for, for a generation. Um, people can, can argue how long a generation is. They can argue about the fact that whether the Brexit vote um, is a significant change and therefore there should be another one. But I, I think there, there is, in some respects, a legitimacy to, to saying no. Um, but I think it will be very, very difficult to do so. Um, I think in many respects, whether it is uh, an outright SNP majority, which I think is, is very likely, or indeed um, an SNP plus Green, or, or even more weirdly, this, this, this thinking at the moment that there's going to be another sort of SNP-like party that is going to be set up and, and run on the, the regional list to try and create a, a clear pro-independence majority and, and the, the reason behind that is is really technical and boring but it's essentially down to the way that the Scottish Parliament um, elects its, its representatives and MSPs. There's some that have constituents and some that have regions and if you do well at a constituency level you do less well at the regional level and therefore if you split your party in two and have a different party running in the regions, a different party at the local constituency level you can try and get two pro-independence MSPs for the price of one. Um, rather unfair, but this is the kind of tactical voting and positioning that the, the, the pro-independence majority, um, I do think it is a majority in Scotland, are pushing for. And so I fully expect us to see um, from May um, a clear pro-independence majority in Parliament um, being opposed by a clear pro-union majority in Westminster. And I think it's going to be very, very interesting to see um, how that develops in the coming months and years. There's something there as well. I mean, it, it, you wouldn't want to see the situation in Scotland that we saw in uh, Catalan a few years ago, where uh, you know firefighters were defending uh, people trying to vote in a, an, a all right a not constitutional election, but an election set up by the local uh, government or the local administration. And protecting them from federal police, which, you know, that was bad enough seeing it there. It's, it's, it's the last thing you'd want to see here, which which could potentially happen. And eventually, if there is a, a sense that the majority of people want it, the longer you deny it, you only increase and intensify that feeling in Scotland. 
Um, I agree, uh, Alex, as you've said it, as you're right, it, you know, as with Brexit, it's not necessarily about economics, it is about uh, emotion and argument and a, and a sense of being. Although I will then go back on, does anyone know what currency they plan to use? That still still seems an unresolved question from the last election and uh, would seem quite an important one to resolve if uh, the SNP wanted to go into another referendum to me. No, you're, you're absolutely right. And um, whether it's the, the question I think Dan posed about, you know, how will they pay for it with the change in the oil or indeed the, the question there about what currency will they pay for their oil in or sell their oil in? No one knows the answers to these questions and um, no, no one is, is asking them really or, or when they are asking them, they're not being heard. Um, there is just this, um, you know, single-minded approach by the pro-independence um, supporters in Scotland that it will all be fine. Um, that's just a load of, of rubbish, you know, they'll, they'll discredit the, the figures put out by, by their own Scottish Parliament when it, when it doesn't suit them, um, the figures that come out every year to show um, essentially the balance of payments from the UK to Scotland. So um, it's, it's the equivalent of, of sticking your fingers in your ear and going la 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 la, I'm not listening, um, because they're not. Um, and these are all the difficult questions that um, I think an independent Scotland will eventually have to face up to. And that will be a, a really interesting reckoning. And I think the, the impacts of independence in Scotland are going to be many, many times more, um, either the, the significant impacts from coronavirus or indeed what I think will be very limited impact um, from Brexit at the end of this year. Well, of course, the, uh, the SNP are a really, really nationalistic party, aren't they? Because uh, whilst they're striving so hard for independence from uh, from the Westminster Parliament, they uh, they do want to join the EU. So um, that would eventually mean joining the Euro, but you're, you're assuming they'd get let in. But um, so much for their fishing waters as well if they do that. So, yeah, it's a, a crazy situation of, you know, demanding independence in one direction, but wishing to uh, give away those powers to somewhere else. Well, Thanks, Alistair, for your input into this. Uh, we, uh, we English people don't always know exactly what's going on in Scotland, but, um, but thank you for uh, giving your, uh, your insight into that. Now, Mike, I think you've got, uh, there's an article we've had on our website for a little while, or uh, an interview, rather, that we've had on our website for a little while, from uh, the, the Scottish Libertarians. Absolutely. So just, uh, just whilst we've been talking about uh, matters uh, north of the border, um, we just bring your attention to an article from back from April with Tam Laird, the leader of the Scottish Libertarian Party. Now, unlike us three today, he's very much a pro-independence in Scotland, although as he puts it in the interview, um, uh, what drives us is our belief in the right to self-determination all the way down to the individual. We support English independence. If Yorkshire, Cornwall, or even Milton Keynes wanted independence, we'd support it. So interesting article about, uh, they, they have made a, the split in the Libertarian Party between a party in Scotland and and one for the rest of the UK. Um, have a look through, uh, have a read, and uh, yeah, really interesting bunch. We've got plenty more articles on our website, and uh, if you'd like to uh, write for our website or have any stories you'd like us to cover, do please contact us via the Twitter, at Croydon Const, via our Facebook page, via our website, croydonconstitutionalist.uk, or via our email, croydonconstitutionalist at gmail.com. Well, do please subscribe to the podcast and the podcast. And to our YouTube channel, please do like, share, and do leave a review, please. We always like feedback, and it helps others to find the podcast. Thanks once again to uh, Alistair for joining us today and giving us these uh, insights into uh, Scottish politics. Much appreciated. Thanks for having me, Dan and Mike. Much appreciated. And thank you all for listening. Until next time, it's goodbye from me. And goodbye from me. Stay safe, everybody. Hey.